everyone that we are recording this event. Please stay on mute. You may type questions in the chat box and we'll address these during or at the end of the presentation. We may also open the floor at the end so that you can unmute your mic and ask your questions then. And now for our speaker, Dr. Mark Gerdish, trained in general and then cardio, cardiovascular and thoracic surgery at Loyola University Medical Center in Chicago, where he remains on staff as, as an associate professor of thoracic and cardiovascular surgery. He is a partner in Cardiac Surgery Associates, the largest private cardiac surgical group in the country, and became chief of cardiothoracic surgery at Franciscan Health in Indianapolis in 2006. With a focus on heart valve disease, Dr. Gerdish has developed a recognized center for heart valve repair and innovation, including lead enrollment in multiple pivotal trials and first in human devices and regenerative technology. Dr. Gerdish is a national principal investigator in for heart valve regenerative device, heart valve regeneration device, and is instrumental in the development of a multi-institution database to assess success in management of atrial fibrillation. He has published and presented on next generation valve devices and repair, surgery for atrial fibrillation, and rigid, rigid sternal fixation and serves as a peer reviewer for several prestigious medical journals. Dr. Gerdish's practice ranges from multi-valve redo operations to transcatheter procedures, an approach combining minimally invasive and advanced closure techniques with rapid mobilization and recovery has made Dr. Gerdish an advocate for enhanced recovery, even for the most complex patients. He's a founding board member for en Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Cardiac. He has adopted a global patient management strategy that seeks to expand patients' knowledge of their clinical data combined with predictive indices from imaging studies to achieve the clearest understanding of their opportunity for health and longevity. Welcome, Dr. Gerdish. Thank you, Don. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I got to get a shorter bio, huh? Thank you. That was, I really appreciate all of that. But, you know, all of that is, uh, that is all wellspring from being at Franciscan. Uh, I'm going to try to share. Uh, and it says, uh, it can, oh, it's asking me to record. So I guess I have to open my system's preference. Sorry. And it's time I have to do something. Do you just have up in the upper right hand corner the share? Uh, let me see. With arrows? Let me that. Uh, I have a share tray. Uh, in the in the upper right by the leave button, upper right. Do you see share? No, I see. I see it on my. I have a toolbar that says open share tray. Is that what you're talking about? Well, I'm not sure about that. Okay. I just have on our on my team screen. It has. Um, do you have right to do you have to hand it over to me? Maybe is that what you have to do? Like make me the lead person or something. I see a message that says recording has started. Up All right, but you but I need to be able to share my screen. Well, I don't know that I, let me see, because if, if I press share, it's just going to be me sharing my screen, which I have your presentation pulled up, and if you want to just tell me to advance. Well, we, may, we may have to go that, we have to go that route, assuming you have the videos, but uh, is there a way for you to give me command? Um, I, let me see. Make me the principal. I'm going to. Um, Rachel, do you know about, I don't know about handing over. I mean, I just know that on mine, it's just to share. Okay. Cindy's texting me and telling me to go to settings. So I'm going to see what I can find here. We'll give them one minute like this. And then otherwise I'll just have you bring it up. <sighs> yeah, I would try that share tray as well. I tried it, but it tells me oh, okay. I have to do something in systems. I'm 
I've done it a I've done it a thousand times as a Zoom or whatever, but all right, I'm open to share. I know it's, I think I feel like it's a little bit different. Teams is a little bit different than Zoom. I don't see that I have any ability to hand over a screen. All right, well, I opened my share tray and nothing's happening. Closing my share tray. Opening my share tray. All right, you wanna bring it up? I'll just tell you when to change slides. Sure. Okay. Right now, we're not seeing you, of course. Seeing, do you see who we're seeing there? Um, my my um, computer is spinning. Rachel, are you able to share your screen and advance the slides? Yep. Wait, I think I just got it. <laughs> ah. Did I? There it is. Is that me or you, Rachel? That's it's me. me. OK. OK, so if you have it with the videos and everything, that'll be great. Um, and uh, so heart surgery in the time of ERS, I think it's changed a lot uh, in the last really several years. Of course, enhanced recovery after surgery is not new. It's not novel. It's been practiced in, especially in colon surgery, general surgery. Uh, actually had pretty active programs in other segments of surgery at Franciscan that were already exceptional. Uh, Wade Wright had been participating in the anesthesia aspect of that, and we he helped us organize around a lot of the basic principles of enhanced recovery. And uh, I say there, I, I list my partners, and Shanice Johns, who's our ERS nurse, who basically dedicated to ensuring that all the wheels are spinning all the time and that the experience is smooth for everybody and that our standardization is equal across the entire practice. I, ask, I list my partners, of course, because they are ground level support, but I would also say that we have a cast of thousands because as you'll see, um, respiratory therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, pharmacy, anesthesia, OR nursing, uh, floor nursing, CU nursing, um, everybody uh, contributes to the various components of this experience. And we really try to optimize it to the degree that we feel comfortable that it's exactly what we would want for our own loved ones. And in this process over the last several years, we have achieved what I think is a remarkable level of standardization. I have always believed that innovation requires standardization. In other words, you have to identify best practices, optimize them and do it across the board. And that's what we've done because everybody here has the shared interests and goals for the patient. Next. Disclosures next. So um, we founded ERS Cardiac, uh, I think it was in 2017. We started talking about 2016. Uh, this website has been up and running for several years and actually, or for those few years, and is actually a, an award-winning website. If anybody wants to see more of what we're doing on a granular level. You visit this website. It has everybody who participates. It has a lot of literature. It has great depth and ways to reach out to things. Next. And when we published this, the guidelines for perioperative care and cardiac surgery, uh, we did that in 2019. It took us about a year to put that information together. And next, it became the most downloaded uh, and cited paper in the history of JAMA surgery. So we knew that we were making a, a, an impression and we knew that there was a, a groundswell of interest as well. Next. So how do we accelerate recovery? Uh, all of these things have to happen. You're gonna see a fair amount of focus on our pain management strategy because that seems to be the cornerstone. And you'll see that it is really a windfall of our success with so many operative components of this uh, program. Somebody's got the mic on and and some noise there, a little ruffling or something. If, if everybody can silence, who is isn't uh, in mute if they're not actually participating. Thank you. Um, so uh, and so it becomes it starts of course with education. We patients are really encouraged to participate in the entire experience, and they do so. And we really like the fact that we have this kind of long game with them, and we have long term follow up with many of our patients where we've re redirected many people's entire lives and lifestyles. 
Uh, and that starts even preoperatively. I see Robin Eads is on, who's our prehab specialist. And we have the same thing in Lafayette. We have this ability to get people kind of tuned in and dialed in early before they even have surgery. Uh, minimally invasive approaches have really helped a lot with respect to just kind of both the discomfort and psychology of surgery, but it's not the be all end all. Rigid sternal fixation is something we had adapted fully in the last few years and you'll see the impact. Uh, as a consequence of some of our maneuvers, we've been able to really dramatically decrease opioid use and that has led to early mobility, less foggy brain out of the ICU and the key to all of this is multidisciplinary teamwork. Next. So prehabilitation, our assessment up front is really important to us. Frailty assessment, which we do for every patient to determine kind of what their capabilities are coming into the operating room. And then if we have time, if we have time to do a ramp up, we will do prehab with them. Physical activity, exercise, reprogram them as much as we can to optimize their experience for surgery. And again, have them invest in it. Often that includes referral to specialists and you'll see that we have that in, in place where it's almost a you know, speed dial to the specialists that help us manage the patients, whether it be endocrinology or hematology, nutritional optimization is a longstanding program with us. It's really a, a, a spillover from what's been done in other disciplines and uh, that was already in place largely at St. Francis. We've tuned it up a little bit for cardiac. Healthy Living Center referral, I mentioned Robin Eads. We also have a really great Healthy Living Center in Lafayette and we've taken some cues from them. Uh, in getting people in tune to their lifestyle, recognizing that they have choices to make that they can participate not only in their recovery, but in the long game, how long they live and how well they live. Anemia optimization, a programmatic approach to that, so it's standardized for every patient. Exercise before, during, and after. Smoking cessation, which I think we're breaking records on. Uh, and respiratory training, which we start before they even come into the hospital. Next. So surgical pain, I'm gonna talk about it. We're gonna focus a little bit on this because we feel like this was our biggest win and it is the windfall that has led to uh, really an incredible experience for our patients, we think. So, you know, there's the pain related to pain, like I hurt. There's pain related to diminished mobility, weakness, anxiety, dependence on others. People don't like that. Pain due to pain medications, constipation, fogginess, fatigue, Pain causing lack of sleep, which leads to delirium and depression, pain of expensive care and lost wages. So we're trying to address all of that in our package. Next. So we use a lot of powerful drugs for the I hurt pain, but those just cause constipation, obstipation, nausea, delirium, depressed level of consciousness, daytime fatigue, addiction. So we knew that this would be a target. This was something we had to go after and not to take the pain medicine away, but to take the pain away. Next. So you can't just take the drugs away. You have to, the elimination of opioids should be a consequence of a change in practice. The goal is not specifically to decrease opioids, but to change what leads to their need. Opioid reduction should be a windfall from a globally better patient experience. Discharge status, including the need for opioids, is a reflection of how diminished the person is. So when we do surgery, when we, when we pour, perform the operation, how much have we diminished that patient's capacity to function at their normal level. And is, isn't their discharge status, in other words, whether they go home or an extended care facility, isn't that a reflection of how much we diminish them? Isn't the need for opioids even, you know, heavy duty pain medicine, a reflection of how we've affected the patient? Next. So a multidisciplinary teamwork, as I mentioned before, uh, we have this amazing concert of folks contributing to this. And we could not have done this. We should include administration in there. Kudos to Franciscan administration for giving us the laterality and the, and the investment to get this done. Next. So every month, uh, Shanice and Victoria and Justin take turns or work together to run a meeting for us. Shanice is our coordinator for the overall process where we go through every single goal of ERAS cardiac and everybody comes in. Anesthesia shows up, pharmacy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, everybody shows up. Uh, and we have contributions also from our endocrinologists, hematologists, et cetera, uh, so that we can run the entire list and see where we are in our ultimate goals. And every time we reach a goal, we ratchet it up a little more to go on to the next level. And you can see some of the things that we work on 
that we tidy up on and that Shanice gives us the data on, or for example, um, a respiratory therapy might come in and give us the data on you know, extubation times, et cetera, where we are, how can we get better? Next. And it goes on. So uh, all of these things are things we've already achieved, but then we're looking to get to that next level and to maintain it. All of this requires constant maintenance. Next. So preoperative education is crucial. We talk about the minimal opioid use. We don't tell them we won't give it to them. We tell them that we tend not to need it as much and that they're gonna have some discomfort, but we want it to be reasonable. We set expectations for the mobility. In other words, that they're gonna be up and around right after surgery. They work with the physical therapist, occupational therapist, and nursing multiple times a day to get moving, and they're expected to be active in their recovery. Goal is to go home, not to a rehab facility. Next. So, you know, there's times when you have these aha moments. This is a fellow that I did several years ago, one of my early minimally invasive cases. He was a big operation, mitral repair, tricuspid repair, and a maze procedure. He's going home post-op post day four. You can see his mobility. He has no pain. He's fine. And he's fine, next, because we had mastered this. This is cryo nerve block. And it has really changed the experience for the minimally invasive cases. You know, minimally invasive surgery is lovely because it's a little incision, but they still hurt. And with this, we have really been able to dramatically decrease the discomfort, so much so that it's just routine to extubate him in the operating room. Uh, you'll see that most people don't require any narcotics. We actually apply cryo energy directly to the nerve. It freezes that segment of nerve. And you can see this is from a video presentation. And this is a live patient. And once we freeze that, we actually mechanically freeze that nerve. And it will, uh, it will uh, affect the axone for somewhere between eight and 10 weeks usually. And then they recover their sensation. They'll have some numbness, of course, in that distribution, but they don't have pain. And so their mobility is excellent and their hospitalization is short and they get back to their normal activity quickly. Next. So with that, extubating in the operating room, right? Next, right after surgery, you're sitting in the ICU just talking to me. Next, no pain. Same thing here, this guy's ready to chat. Next. And then we have lots of great stories of people that were so positively affected and we get to enjoy all this. I'd like to show this not only for uh, the staff here, but I love it when the nurses know just what kind of impact they have on people. I have patients in my office that are crying because they didn't have any pain. They're crying because they had such a good experience in the hospital. They can't believe how great the nursing staff was, how motivating they were. These two gals came in, they were good friends. For some reason, they both had the same pathology. They both came in on the same day to have their mitral valve repairs. They both went home feeling fine, obviously huggable next. And then the one on the left, her daughter came in to have the same operation a few months later. And they all had mitral valve disease, next. And then they all go home and they're good and next. And then they go on their individual adventures. This is the, the, the younger gal who's the tall gal. That's her, that's actually her ranch in Wyoming. She came from Wyoming for her surgery, went back there with her mom, tended to her cattle and uh, actually just spoke to her a couple days ago. Next. And then you can see mountains climbing mountains. So uh, we learned early that with optimal management, by giving it a perfect operation still through a small incision, by managing pain and expectations that we could get people back to their normal lives. Next. But we still have to do sternotomies. You know, most people having heart surgery, we still have to do sternotomies. Multi-valves, redo-redos, coronary bypass surgery, they all need sternotomies. So how do we, what do we do to that? What are we gonna do so that we can change that experience for the sternotomy to be equivalent to what I just showed you? Next. So here's the elephant. ERAS translate into getting back to normal quickly and dependably. The primary obstacle is the elephant in the room. It's the division of the largest bone in the chest. Next. So what if we treat every sternum like a divided bone? That sounds silly, but for 50 years, we've been putting sternums together with baling wire. I remember I listened to uh, Tom Fogarty, who invented the Fogarty balloon, giving a talk, and he's probably almost 90 years old now. But his one sentence that he said to me stuck with me for a few decades, which was, if you've been doing something the same way for 30 years, chances are you're doing it wrong. 
meaning that we should advance, we should change. And heart surgery, cardiac surgery is the only realm where people divide a bone, surgeons divide a bone, and they don't put it back together rigidly. They don't fix the bone. I mean, think about if you had a car accident and the only thing that happened to you is that your sternum was split right down the middle. And you get admitted to the hospital and the surgeon goes in there and puts some wire around your sternum and says and sends you home. Is that the way to repair a bone? It's never been the way to repair a bone, but we do it over and over again. So we adopted a 100%, everybody gets their bone fixed properly at the end of the case. And this changed the entire experience for the patient. Next. So, uh, why do we not let people move normally after sternotomy, right? The re why do they, with wire, why don't we let them move? Because of the pain and because of the instability. Next. We did, we participated in a study in 2017. Initially, I got in, we got on that study and I kind of lost interest in it actually. I wasn't really sure it meant something and then kind of faded out of it. And then we went back to that study because I realized there was something real about it. And in that study, we showed that we could eliminate wound complications, have less pain, better mobility. We went on to publish two other papers based on that study, next. But maybe more importantly, this fellow, his son sends me this video and it's this 82 year old guy taking his 13 pound bowling ball and whipping it down that lane and, and getting a strike six weeks after he had heart surgery. So I thought, well, this tells us something. Maybe we can loosen things up a little bit, next. And walking into patient's room, I would see them breaking all the rules. You're not supposed to put your hands over your head after heart surgery with astronomy because it hurts and because it makes it create instability. But nobody was paying attention because they weren't hurting and they weren't unstable. Next. So we changed what we did. We don't wait for the bone to heal. We've created an aggressive process for restoring the patient's overall integrity using these techniques to diminish or reverse the physical trauma and eliminate the pain. And then went after their mobility. So great a minimal pain medication, getting their bowels to work, mental, uh, positive mental perspective, right? You eliminate the pain, you give them their mobility, they feel normal, they're better. Next. So pain comes from that sternum. It comes from other places too. So we're going to have to tack it on all the different fronts, right? So the bone, and then there's just kind of general aches and pains, et cetera. Next. So we have a very kind of comprehensive method for managing all this. We have great buy-in from our anesthesia partners who are marvelous clinicians and, and standardized with us on everything. So in the operating room, every patient gets an erector spinae block, meaning they get injection into the, the erector spinae along their spine at the beginning of the operation before we put them to sleep. And it takes them about 10 minutes. And it gives them this kind of general sense of comfort around their, around their chest in the muscular planes. They also get IV acetaminophen and we use Presidex, which is a little bit of a wonder drug for us. We give them lidocaine as also a little bit of a general pain reduction protocol. Next. Post-operatively, mobility depends on those minimal opioids, right? We want them off those drugs. Plus we wanna just keep them away from the drugs that people end up getting addicted to. People who have sternotomies, if you look at the data, somewhere between six and 12% of them become persistent users. Uh, so post-operatively, IV acetaminophen, which uh, I fought a fight for for quite a while and then we got it. And being able to use that intravenously and not have to depend on PO absorption really helped us kind of take the edge off. Uh, Presidex, we use it in the ICU, we even use it in the step-down unit. The nurses are able to manage that drug brilliantly to take uh, the edge off for anxiety and even help people sleep at times. Lidocaine infusion, fentanyl. So only in the first eight, first eight hours after surgery do we have opioids available and it's fentanyl, a short acting agent that the nurses can use as needed. Often they don't use it at all because the patient's not hurting. And we gotta give them something. They need to take a pill for pain. We put them on gabapentin and we keep them on it on a weaning dose after they leave the hospital. We stop it as soon as we see any neurologic issues, or, uh, changes in mental function, et cetera. And the folks who don't have coronary bypass, we use Toradol, which as you know, is kind of a wonder drug. Uh, it's uh, ibuprofen on steroids. Uh, lidocaine patches where we need. And then I put pressure points on there because sometimes I'll walk into a patient room, are you hurting? Yeah, I hurt right here below my little right scapula. And I go in there, I put my knuckles in there and they're like, oh, I feel so much better. So sometimes you just gotta get to the point of where they hurt, not give them a systemic dose of medication, just like we would do for ourselves at home. They need some help, right? So people may need some help with that. Next. 
So let's look at six month windows in our house of pain. What did it look like? 2015 is before we started ERS. 2017, we're getting warmed up. And then you'll see the progress in 20 and 22. Next. This is fresh data. Some of it I haven't even seen. She needs to put it together. So we don't include in this fentanyl drips because they're, they often have their ventilator times greater than eight hours. These are sick people. Uh, they're on propofol. They're emergent cases, endocarditis, shock, uh, unable to acquire data really good for them uh, for more if they're more than two years ago when they have IV continuous drips of fentanyl. But all of the other patients were able to document every dose of narcotics. So we have those outliers. I'll show you something important though, next. With the program, as we proceeded to, and we did not, the acuity of our patients didn't change at all. If anything, they be, the acuity went up. We had sicker, more complex patients. But during that same time, we saw a dramatic drop in the use of fentanyl drips. So what we learned was that we didn't need those drugs as much. Next. So what's the average for minimally invasive narcotic use? It's essentially doesn't, we just don't give it to them. 2015, 241, these are uh, MMEs, which are morphine equivalents. By the time we get to 2020, they're gone. It's the equivalent of one oxycodone or something. It's a 98% de decrease in the use of narcotics during their hospitalization. Absolutely revolutionary, certainly the lowest in the, in the country. Next, sternotomy. This is really crazy though, right? So now we've gone with people with full sternotomies. We start the rigid plate fixation protocol in 2017. We start to recognize the beneficial effects. We enhance it with the protocol I described earlier with anesthesia providing a block with managing using other medications. And we drop down to on average, as you can see now in 2022, the equivalent of four pills a 90% reduction in the use of opioids. Now it's not because our, our goal isn't just to get rid of opioids. Yeah, they're nasty drugs, but our goal is to achieve the same. We want them to feel just as comfortable as they did in 2015 without the opioids so we can have them pooping and walking and clear minded. Next. Zero narcotics, minimally invasive cases, somewhere between 70 and 90% don't get any narcotics the whole time they're in the hospital, even that first eight hours. Next, even more mind boggling is that 50% of the sternotomies, no narcotics, none even in the first eight hours. A lot of these people will excavate in the operating room too, even for sternotomies. Next, pain scores, they drift down, but more importantly, they're not going up. Remember, we took away high dose opioids in 2015 and took them to almost nothing in 2022. And all that happened was the pain score stayed the same, but went down. Next. And they're good pain scores or low pain scores. So example, I just like people to understand what we're talking about. This is a 68 year old guy. He's had a big redo operation. He's post up day five, he's going home. He's not going to an extended care facility. He can do whatever he wants with his arms. He's getting out of bed, he's moving around. That is, there's zero sternal precaution going on there. We do talk to him about you trying to use both arms, but as you can see, it doesn't always work. Next. And as you know, we have some big people. I, I don't remember, I think this guy's BMI is 58 or something. Did a big operation on him. He's sending you over to hemiarch, aortic valve replacement, mitral valve repair, maze. He's going home post-op day four. Why? Because he hasn't had any pain, because he feels fine. He can get out of his chair. There's no way that guy goes home otherwise. Next. Old people, this is a miracle. <laughs> you know, old people, they don't want to go to a nursing home and they don't want to be in a hospital long and they want to go home. Now, the beauty of this, I love showing this slide because whenever I present it at meetings, uh, I ask people what's wrong with this slide and they say, well, she's three hours post-op, she's not on a ventilator and she's not following any external precautions because she's sleeping comfortably on her side. So people don't, they don't let people sleep on their sides right after stenotomies. Next, that same woman, this is her post-op day two, still got her chest tube in. She goes home post-op day four, five and goes back to work three weeks after surgery. 82 years old, next. So we always have to keep in mind, in addition to all of these wonderful effects, 
we have the fact that opioids are a problem. And so there are, there are entire meetings dedicated to this. Next. The biggest problem comes next in these younger guys because they do hurt more. No, go back. Sorry. They do hurt more. And you'll have to go back one more and then advance. And, uh, and so they become more dependent more quickly. Next. So this is a guy that and normally I would have done this operation minimally invasively, but I couldn't because it was such a broad based tumor. We still went home on day two, no narcotics, and he's driving his car a week later. His life has not been disrupted. Next. Same for this lad. He came in with acute MI, had an urgent cabbage, had an integrated bloom pump. He went home post op day two. He loves that car. And because he wasn't having pain, not only did he not need narcotics, but he quit smoking. I don't think he, it's much harder to get people off cigarettes if they're hurting. But if you give them their life back and they're not hurting, it's a little bit easier for a dedicated smoker to stop. Next. This is a guy who had a redo, a revolve replacement. Three weeks later, he swapped the golf ball. He was so excited that you know, he recorded a video for us. And that's not unusual. Next. This is another guy three weeks out from any aortic valve replacement, ascending aorta, back to his entire life. Now, this guy had some comorbidities, including I think he had uh, lupus, he had osteoporotic bone. Doesn't look too osteoporotic there, does it? Next. So here's one for you. You got this guy swinging a golf club, and you got this guy fast pitching. I think if you click, that one will start. And the question is who had a sternotomy three weeks ago? Next. It's him. He, I didn't tell him to do that. I don't tell people to go hit fast pitch, but I've had other people show up after playing softball three weeks after surgery. Next. So we got rid of the sternal precautions, essentially. These are, you know, in the past, we had all kinds of restrictions. Next. We moved on 2015 next from all these restrictions to less restrictions next where we are now, which is we're just trying to get people not to do everything right away. But we've loosened up a lot and probably the most important thing there is a week after surgery, we will after after discharge, actually, we will evaluate you come back and see Cindy or one of the uh, PAs. If everything looks good, you can drive. And that is the prize with patients. That's the thing. If you let them drive, they're feeling comfortable, they're moving well, they can turn their head quickly, they can go back to doing their, their normal things, it changes their entire experience. Next. So, great, everyone's happier, but what about the money? Oh boy, you guys are spending money. Well, minimal pain, full mobility, no extended care facility. Next. Let's see the translation. Why? Well, SNFs plus LTAX equal money and misery. Nobody likes them. People get sick of them. Our highest rate of readmission is always from those institutions. And it's not because they're bad places. It's just they can't do as well as we can do with that patient at home. Eating their normal food, up walking around, sleeping in their own bed. And there's expense uh, attached to that. Next. And remember, you know what? We're not gonna we're not gonna dodge the bundle of care thing for long. It's coming, and it's actually our responsibility to show fiscal responsibility beyond 30 days. In fact, we look at readmissions not just at 30 days. We look at them at 90 days, even though we're not. So you know, it's not SDS doesn't ask us to do that. We do it anyway, just to make sure that we're keeping people out of the hospital, and we stay single digit all the time. Next. And this is actually a paper written to talk about that by Keith Horvath, whom I know, who's dedicated as always a heart surgery, who's dedicated his life to looking at doing the math for heart surgery next. And in that paper, it's basically this, the winners and the losers. And the winners on top are the folks who are not putting people into extended care facilities, extended rehab and expensive places for them to be before they go home. Next. So how did we do? Well, we did exactly the same thing. Uh, almost as a premonition, when we looked at us and we did a bond, we did participate in bundle care. 
We did all the things that we do with all the fancy stuff that we do, and we spent some money while they're in the hospital. But the 2,444 and the 5,237 are the savings that we had past the bundle care expense on our patients. And the 2,444 is valve surgery. And not a lot of hospitals participated in the valve segment because those are expensive patients. We use a lot of expensive devices. Sometimes there are multiple valves. The bundle care didn't care what we were putting in the patients. But the important thing to see is that toward the end of those bars, those green bars where they're in rehab, Small. And that's where we save the money in the 90 day window. Next. New persistent opioid use is comes up in our journal every three months. Next. And so these are these two elements, right? Can we send people home without narcotics and can we send them to their house, not to their to a rehab? And if we look at what happened and you look at each of these years, this is their discharge to facilities. Now, this is minimally invasive. Obviously, we went down to no, essentially nothing for narcotics at discharge for minimally invasive. And discharge to extended care facilities, that might be the, the occasional patient with endocarditis or something that's very sick after we do a minimally invasive operation, they go to extended care facility. Not too surprising here. Next. Here's the stuff though. We go, once we started initial ERS, we didn't drop our discharge with narcotics. When we recognize the pain was gone is when we dropped it. So you see in 2020 and 2022, we're down to single digit numbers of discharges, new discharges with narcotics. And the most important thing, in my opinion, is that we went from 30%, which is not a very high discharge to extended care facility, down to 9%. And people know the acuity of our patients and the complexity of the cases we do. Only 9% of those patients are going to extended care facilities for sternotomy patients. Next. So what's next? We you know, we've tackled this. Uh, actually, I was just on the call this morning with some folks who are developing software that they're gonna try and mimic what we're doing. They're gonna come and do a ground up analysis of our work and they want to be able to recapitulate it in other centers and I think that's great but I want to stay a step ahead and I want to integrate new technology and we're already doing that next so one of the things that we participated in was uh, we were the first center I think we we're the first center actually to implement we were one of the first three or four centers to actively participate in the use of hypotensive predictive indices which is a hemodynamic monitoring system that uh, looks at arterial waveforms. Again, I'm gonna take you back to that comment. If you've been doing something the same way for 30 years, you're probably doing it wrong. The Swan-Ganz catheter has been the cornerstone of hemodynamic monitoring for cardiac surgery forever. And every time we look at it in the literature, the use of a Swan-Ganz catheter is associated with negative outcomes. So we had to get rid of the thing. It was like a leash. So what we did was we moved over to this technology, which analyzes algorithmically an analyzes the uh, arterial waveform and gives us uh, beat to beat changes in contractility, uh, ejection fraction, and allows us to calculate uh, peripheral resistance. And it also gives us predictive indices. Of, it basically will tell you in 10 minutes, you're going to become hypotensive, you should test. So the nurses have taken command of this and uh, they are masters of it beyond my skill, quite honestly. Uh, and they know how to use fluid challenges and pressors to determine what the mechanism is for the impending hypotension and avoid it. Next. So with that automaticity, with that patient, with the nurses having the ability to do that on their own, uh, we participated in this study and we we saw improvement in SI in the incidence of uh, of the need for um, inotropes reduction in the need for pressors, and a 15% reduction of length of stay. In the paper that we just published, there was also a 40% uh, reduction in time to extubation, but that didn't happen to us because our time to extubation was so short already. It just happened in the other centers that participated. Next. And this is what the program looks like. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward algorithm uh, that our nurses have been able to optimize hemodynamics with our patients. And this allows them then to give us input. When they call us, they've already tested the scenario and they're able to give us some information on where they are. Next. Blood conversation, conversation, conservation, sorry. Uh, without going into the details of this, I thought it was important just to 
remark on it because this has really been a multi-component uh, process for us where we have standardized protocols for addressing anemia preoperatively in the hospital. And it starts preoperatively, it runs through the operating room and finishes as the patient's leaving. And we have this marvelous relationship with our hematologists uh, and a shout out to Dr. Raghavendran who's basically on speed dial for us to uh, help us determine the best way to optimize people's anemia preoperatively. We do a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses and we're comfortable with it uh, largely because of these protocols. Next. With that, we've progressively ratcheted up our threshold for transfusion to the point where they require uh, some combination of these uh, indices in the operating room. And we have a very finely tuned perfusion program that is uh, goal directed. Um, and we are able to get these same great outcomes without giving people blood. Next. And the same is in the postoperative period where we still have one of the lowest rates of transfusion for the hospital stay at under 25%, which is really quite remarkable. Next. Our excavation strategy, I alluded to some of this. We, you'll see down on the right-hand lower corner there, that's actually a resistive breathing apparatus we have people do muscle training with before they come into the hospital. Uh, we have absolutely marvelous team of respiratory therapists and the anesthesiologists that have helped with the, with the protocol, where again, it's almost impossible to lower our timed extubation because it's so low, but next. Uh, and you can see we're less than three hours till extubation, which is amazing in a complex group of patients. That's average time to extubation. Next. But also, we've been able to move up the ladder on in-OR extubations, which I'm trying to get credit from SDS for because they won't, they basically won't allow us to compute that into time to extubation. Um, and it's, uh, I, you know, patients really like it. They're very excited about getting the tube out before they leave the operating room, especially if they can be comfortable. And then they're sitting chatting with their family in a couple hours. Next. Uh, we have a fancy chest tube device that we trialed two different systems. One of them we sent back to the drawing board. They came back. So basically we partner with folks to really investigate whether with their system can help our patients. We pilot it, we collect data, we do short loop feedback. So we take nothing for granted. We don't just ask for something and then start doing it. We ask for something and then we look for the ROI and we demonstrate whether it's benefiting our patients. And in fact, this is Shanice's data, early data on using these fancy chest tubes, which uh, I really, I threw them out the first time they came through and said, you guys got to go back to the drawing board. They came back with a better device. And you can see all of the benefits that we're seeing with that. With the use of those tubes, we're seeing dramatic improvements in a lot of, a lot of, and this has actually been shown in, in now in a randomized control study that was done in Canada. Next. So, investing in patients' management and experience on the front end, aggressively seek to lessen the burden of postoperative experience. I always say we're creating a boutique experience, but it's standardized. It's individualized in the sense that we're looking for every opportunity to optimize the patient's particular experience, but we standardize toward these methodologies. Ear room extubation, up the day of surgery, safe transition to home, eliminate the narcotics as a consequence of eliminating the pain, restore full mobility with a rapid and consistent approach, and then say goodbye to sterile precautions and try to get people healthy, uh, well days at home. That's our goal, the Mac to maximize that part of their experience. Next. Thank you. And I'm free for questions. Hi, Mark. This is Joe LaRosa with the ACO. And I wanted to congratulate you on just a phenomenal talk today. It was just, you're always such an inspiring speaker. And, and it was just as awesome. So thanks for being part of our medical team. And thanks for improving patient satisfaction with this, uh, all the techniques that you've done and perfected. Thanks for the uh, the uh, bundle payment success from the ACO standpoint, and also congratulations on reducing sniff length of stay. That's just great. That's uh, right up our alley. Two questions for you. They're kind of interrelated. You didn't mention, or maybe I missed it. Um, I'm assuming you do home patient monitoring for a certain period of time, and I wasn't sure what exactly devices you use, smart devices, and do you use um, um, home health daily, or or what was what's that? What what's your stick to to help with that sniff avoidance? 
So uh, such a great question, Joe, and thank you for that. Um, and I will actually mention, I see Mike Tuchek is on, one of my partners who runs the program and uh, along uh, with Dr. Fitzgerald in Crown Point. And Mike was actually the guy who uh, who made, who made mentioned to me that he was sending some patients home day two. They did the same protocol. And he's the reason I started sending people home day two. Um, so as far as specific to your question, uh, we basically work with social work, physical therapy, and we kind of take the temperature of the situation with respect to the home environment. And so we will titrate the home monitoring based on what the patient needs are and what their engagement is going to be there. So some patients, they need physical therapy at home. Some patients, they need daily nursing, uh, nurse visits. The, the, I have to say the home nursing in general has been outstanding. Uh, uh, as mo everybody knows, most of my patients go home with my cell phone number. So they just call me if something pops up and we deal with it there, then and there. And that helps keep them out of the hot from coming back to the hospital. We, we did work with a patient engagement tool for a while. Uh, we, that came from our own guidelines, the ERS guidelines that we published. Uh, we went with the, the, the device system that was having the most success, but then we realized that we were actually our own best patient engagement system. So we, we dropped that. Um, patients, we just make sure we stay in close connection with them. The most important thing is that when folks need to come back and see us quickly, we do it. So uh, it, we'll, we'll reach out to them a couple days after they get home. And we have most of the folks come back a week now after their discharge for two reasons. One is we want to kind of see where they are in the arc of their recovery. And that's for folks that are a little bit sicker. And the other reason is the people that are the healthier people that are responding, you know, right away to the experience and getting better right away. We want to cut them loose and let them drive and get back to their normal lives. So I think just tightening that timeline. Um, I would say the most important thing that we can do in a man in ERS now, my, my like my my goal every day is how do we. How do we tighten the timeline of everything? These are, there are, com there are components of the experience that we know exist, right? Whether that's home nursing or physical therapy while they're in the hospital or whatever it is. Can we, can we move those things together so that there aren't these downtimes in between and get people fully recovered quicker? So we try to try titrate it according to the patient's experience. And I would say that the nurses, especially the home nursing that come out of Franciscan are outstanding and great communicators. Thank you, appreciate it. Are there any other questions or if anyone has a question, you can put it in the chat as well. Mark, it's Mike Tuchek. Thanks for the compliment about two days, but hey, Mike. you kind of taught, taught me it could be done. Um, what do you tell all the systems out there, including you know mine and any other private hospital or academic center? What do you tell them? When they say, look, we're an administrator and we can't afford to do all this fancy stuff. We just can't get involved. It's too expensive. We don't have the staff. It's COVID. We've lost people. I mean, you make a very good argument here for those of us who are interested, but there's a whole lot of administrators, et cetera, systems that aren't interested, even though they want the same results. How do you convince them? Well, what should we be saying out there to convince them, hey, look, this special chest tube or the special technology or whatever it is. What, what do you say to them? So, you know, and I appreciate that question, Mike, because it's super important because I get it all the time. And there are a couple of components to it. First of all, um, I, uh, I, one of the things that bothers me is sometimes heart surgeons are lazy. They won't go to the floor. They won't, they won't present the data. They won't bring the device, explain what it's going to do, and, and then promise to give data back and to show results. I mean, you can see here, I mean, there's no arguing with my, our results, our program's results. So if they commit themselves to collecting data and giving short loop feedback, they say, well, I can't do that, I don't have the staff. If you got a PA or an NP or somebody, you can get the work done at the outset. The other thing I always say is, you know what, why don't you uh, have your administrator listen to one of my talks? Just have them get on and, and then have the administrator explain to me what their goals are. What are, you know, what are the real goals? I, you know, I, I have to admit that one of the blessings we have is this is a mission driven institution. So if something's better, it's better. And you do, as long as it is not 
uh, having a negative impact on the patients and not having a negative impact on the bottom line, which obviously this does not. Uh, and you're favoring the long game for the patients, then we get to do it. Uh, but I'm a very data-driven person, as you know. Uh, you know, we publish everything. I'm about to publish this data. It's being written up as we speak. And, um, you know, that's all I can do is offer them the science. And, and at the end of the day, are there cost savings, right? So you talked about the fancy chest tubes. This, we thought this was a crazy idea, but we had to pilot it. They, we brought it in twice, two different devices. We sent them back. Third time was a charm. So you could see all those positive impacts translate to a shorter hospitalization, less pericardial fusions, less tack backs, less inflammation, less atrial fibrillation, and all of that, the math is actually super easy with that. So we are gonna always look at where the science is. Whatever comes next that makes sense, we're going to challenge it. Um, and there are things that we don't do. Like I said, we had the patient engagement tool. We made that investment initially, and then we took it back. We shut it down because it didn't make a difference. We couldn't see impact. So that's that's my long-winded answer to that, Mike. I offer always to have administra administrators come and talk to me or to hear a talk. I think that's important. That's a great response. Follow-up. Of the two things that you think make the most difference, hmm. is it nar narcotics and mobility? Are those the two things? I think that... When an administrator asks me yeah. that, that's what they want to know. Yeah, I think as a windfall, uh, so I think they have, it's really important they think in broader terms, right? So I think as a windfall of the decrease in discomfort and and the ability to move your arms and use your arms, get up and down from a toilet, up and down from a chair, in and out of bed, the decrease in narcotics, which avoids the fogginess, the constipation, the limited activity, right? You can't drive when you're on narcotics. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's the mobility, but it's really the fact that we give them back their lives sooner. You know, it takes, it takes away that fear of, oh, I'm going to hurt and I can't do anything. And these, you know, a lot of these people do things all the time. They're hard workers. They want back in the game immediately. So it's a bit, it's a bigger picture than that. I think that, yeah, okay. Mobility and narcotics, but let's not just say it's narcotics because you can take people's narcotics away. You can figure out ways to do that. You can change whatever pain medication you're using. You can, you know, limit their prescriptions. But what I really want to do is I want them back in their lives and I want them feeling well. And until you have that, then you don't really have a win. And that's, that's the game. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? I have the uh, evaluation uh, link posted in the chat. And if you are calling from a phone or a non Franciscan, uh, just uh, you can get the, the uh, link in uh, email. So um, just check that too. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gerdish. Thank you for sharing your information and thank you everyone for being on this meeting. We appreciate it. Um, the, we'll stop the recording now. And, yeah. uh, and I would add thanks to the entire team that has allowed helped us do this. Amazing team at Franciscan. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Great job. Thank great you. Great talk, Mark. Thanks.